Hi, my name's Paul Sweeting and I'm a Professor of Actuarial Science at the University of Kent. Um, now, actuarial science is mostly about money and death, which means that I don't get invited to an awful lot of parties. Um, but when I do go to a party, if someone finds out that I'm an actuary, they may well ask me, well, how long am I likely to live? Um, and this does genuinely happen. And I'll say to them, well, it's not a very simple calculation. There's two things you need to look at. The first is how long you are likely to live into the distant future, but the first is just how likely you are to make it out through the next year. And to try to find out how likely that me, might be, there's a number of things that I can try to find out about you. You know, how old are you? Um, what's your gender? That's usually a fairly easy one to, to find out. Do you smoke? Do you drink? If you smoke or drink, how much do you smoke or drink? How healthily do you live? How much do you earn? Um, do you exercise often? Uh, what's your access to healthcare like? Lots of questions that you could ask, many of which you'll lie about, many others that even if you don't lie about, you won't necessarily know what the answers are. But there is one way that you can find out some of this information quite easily, and that's to find out where someone lives. Someone's postcode gives you a pretty good indication of a number of these factors. And the reason it does this is because when you look at the census, you have a vast amount of information which is broken down by postcode. Now, not only that, but you also do have mortality rates broken down by postcode as well. So, on the face of it, you could just take these mortality rates by postcode and work out how likely someone is to live. Unfortunately, there are few enough people in each postcode that if you try to do that, there's just too much noise around the data. So, what we can do is we can say, well, let's look at the mortality rates in each postcode. Let's look at all these other factors that we've got from the census. And then let's try to pick out how much of these differences in mortality rates are just due to random noise, and how much are due to these underlying factors. Then, when someone tells us the, their postcode, we use that to infer all of these other factors, and then we use those factors to tell us how long they are likely, to, or how likely they are to live one more year. So, if we do that, we've got an indication of how likely someone is to survive another year. But that doesn't answer the question that I have been asked, which is, how long am I going to live? And to do that, you need to project from the chance of living for one year to how long you are likely to live in total. So, the chance of living from now to next year, from next year to the year after that, and so on. Now, if you're trying to carry out these sorts of calculations, you've got to look at how mortality rates are going to change over time. And this is quite a tricky question to answer because um, what has caused mortality rates to change in the past might not necessarily cause them to change in the future. And this, the way you start this sort of analysis is you actually do build a pattern of historical mortality rates and, ju and just try to see from those what sort of patterns do exist. So when you set out mortality rates across all the previous years that you've got, and you've got about 160, 170 years of history for the UK, and across all ages, what patterns can you see there? The clearest pattern is the difference between male and female. The next clearest is between ages. There's a very clear progression of mortality across ages. I mean, essentially, once you get to your 20s, um, mortality rates increase exponentially from then. Um, there's another pattern that you can also see underlying this called a cohort effect. Now, the cohort effect is something which says it's not just about um, how old you are and what year um, we're looking at, but also it's about the year that you were born in. There are some patterns which relate to particular years of birth and things that happened to children born in those particular years. So, for example, the flu pandemic tended to mean that children born in around 1919 were a little less healthy than those born 1918 or 1920. The introduction of the NHS meant that children born around that time got a one-off improvement in their chance of survival across their whole lifetime compared to people born before that. So this is quite an interesting pattern of mortality rates that you can use to help project mortality going forward. But if you're doing this, you're still just looking at mortality rates as a whole. And it's more interesting and more useful to look at the individual causes of death because mortality rates um, can be caused by a large number of things. Um, accidents, infection, 
um, illness. Um, I could go on and I tend to at parties. Um, but the thing is, if you understand how these underlying causes change, you have a much better chance of getting the overall mortality rates right, the overall changes in mortality rates right. So if you look back over historical mortality rates, going back to say the 1840s, what you find is you get a big surge in improvement um, around the end of the period of industrialization where people are already coming to the cities but then they started building better sewerage works, um, they started building cleaner water supplies, sanitation improved. This caused a one-off drop in certain infectious diseases. Then if you look around the end of the Second World War, you got another one-off improvement because of the introduction of antibiotics. Again, a whole class of infectious diseases that used to be very important, that used to really cause an awful lot of deaths, was essentially wiped out. And we've seen most recently, over the last 20 or 30 years, a really large drop in the deaths from circulatory diseases, from heart disease and from strokes. I'm unprecedented. Now the reason that it's interesting to look at these is if you looked at mortality rates as a whole, you would say, well, look at how much mortality has improved over the last 30 years in the UK. Our best estimate must be that it's likely to improve at the same rate going forward. Well, not necessarily, because if you look at the improvement in mortality rates from heart disease, you can see that there's no way that they can improve in the future as much as they have in the past. There just aren't enough people still dying of heart disease to not die in the future. And if you look at it that way, you can see, well, maybe the future isn't going to be as bright as the past in terms of mortality improvements. There's another aspect of this as well, which makes even this cause of death modelling um, a little tricky, because the reason for the improvement in mortality rates from smoking is, uh, sorry, from heart disease, is because people don't smoke anymore, or not so many people smoke as they used to. Now, this has some fairly involved effects. The first thing is, as soon as you stop smoking, your chance of heart disease drops rapidly, very soon afterwards. However, it takes much longer for your chance of dying of a whole range of cancers to start reducing. So it might be that if the population as a whole suddenly stopped smoking, you'd have a big drop in the rate of heart disease. But you'd actually have a pickup in the rate of cancer because you'd have all these people who are no longer dying of heart attacks were around enough to start developing the cancers that wouldn't have killed them in the past. So it's quite an involved process and it's one which is quite difficult to um, get to grips with in terms of getting hold of enough data to carry out this sort of modelling. But having said this, this is the sort of modelling which I am doing and it's not just because um, I like having interesting conversations at parties, it's also because it is very financially important. If you think about institutions like pension schemes, pension schemes these days, um, you don't have many people earning new benefits in a new final salary pension scheme. So you've got a whole load of benefits that need to be paid out to people. And you've got a big pot of money there which you hope will be enough to pay those benefits. Well, will it be enough or not? Part of the answer to that is around how much will I get in terms of returns on my money, but the other is what benefits will I need to pay? How long are all these people likely to live for? And carrying out this sort of analysis on the broad demographic profile of the population and how it is likely to change gives you an idea of whether you're likely to have enough money or not and, and how, how certain you are about the answer to that question. Similarly, if you look at insurance companies, when they're looking at charging life insurance premiums or selling annuities to people, they're faced with exactly the same questions. Some will come to them and they will ask some information about them and, and the reason for those long questionnaires and life insurance forms is because they want to have an idea of how likely you are to make it to the next year or to survive for another 20 or 30 years. So the analysis that we carry out is really very closely tied to the way in which a lot of these large financial institutions work and if you think about UK pension schemes I mean they have assets and liabilities of well over a trillion sterling. So there's a lot of money there and a lot of liabilities that need to be paid out. So I hope that uh, you found that um, interesting and can see the relevance of this research as well. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>